One and all, um, thank you for coming and taking the time to join us today. Just so you're aware, this event is being recorded and will be made available for those who cannot attend today. Um, HSE, the Arb Association and Lantra have been working together to make sure there is consistency in the approach to TG1, Technical Guide 1, uh, and the training to support this approach. We are, we've all worked together to basically to make sure that we have one consistent voice and that we can help you all uh, prepare to work under these regulations. So the structure of the event today will be, uh, the start will be introduced by Cathy Gostick from HSE. Uh, this will give a short background of why the changes were required and the benefits for industry going forward. Um, the Arb Association will be by Simon Richmond, who's Senior Technical Officer at the Arb Association. Uh, Simon will look at things from the AA position and how TG1 has developed and, uh, and how we have arrived at the position we're in now. And then I will talk about the training and qualification programmes on behalf of Lantra. I'm Head of Industry Partnerships at Lantra. My name is Sean Duffy. Um, and then we will go through five short videos. Um, which are all about working with the new requirements and how to implement them going forward. And then we will cover the section with questions and answers uh, at the end. You can, we've had some questions sent in already, but then there will be uh, an opportunity to submit questions via the Q&A panel on your screen below. So if you want to submit anything, we'll try and answer them. Um, we'll try and answer all of them as we can, but anything that isn't picked up today will be responded to and you'll have a full answer and all the uh, questions and answers will be made available uh, over the next couple of days. Okay, thank you. So I'll pass over now to Cathy, uh, who will take over from the HSC. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much for connecting today. I hope you can see my screen okay. Could somebody let me know that it's up all right before I start off? Good, right. Um, I'm Cathy Gostick, I'm based in the Edinburgh office um, when I get to go in and I have the policy lead for Aboriculture. I mainly do forestry. I'm temporarily filling the post and we hope to have it permanently filled um, in the near future. Um, I'm here today, as Sean said, to introduce the legal change required in methods of full protection, which has come about by the work at height regulations. Um, and then obviously some technical detail will follow with, uh, with the presentations following me. Um, I have a basic knowledge of tree climbing. I'm not here for the technical stuff. I'm really here to give you the legal background and why it came about. Um, experts have been involved or people consulted with and uh, they're here today to try and show you some of the house. Um, the background to this is that um, it's been looked at for a while as it has in many industries when the work at height regs came out um, an analysis of um, accidents recently between 16 and 18 over two years showed 23 accidents one of which was a fatal and they all involve serious fractures of people falling out of trees um, and we'll i'll show this a bit later of the full analysis of the one line working that was looked at when we looked at this but that's the background as to why the focus came about um, since the introduction of the work at height regulations back in 2005, much of the industry has continued to climb on a single rope without any particular analysis of whether this complies with the law. And therefore, HSE began to focus on this and consulted with the ARP Association, um, who represent the views of its members. Um, the full background to this is available in an, art an AA article, which you can have a look at, and I put the link up here. Um, we will be um, sharing the presentations, Sean, later on, so people can use these links. So you've got your, I can't hear because you, you're muted. Okay, I presume we will do. Um, but just wanted to point out that this has been sort of mentioned before. If you look back at the history, which is detailed in that um, link, the FASCO and the um, AA Guide to Good Climbing Practice back in 98 recommended the use of supplementary anchor points in two separate lines wherever possible. So it's not a completely new thing, but here we're here today to really show the effort that's been put into now looking at it in detail in terms of legal requirements. So we start off with Health and Safety at Work Act um, because it brings in the terminology so far as reasonably practical which is relevant here in some parts. Um, reasonable practicality involves weighing the nature of the risk against the trouble time and money needed to control it um, and there is further guidance there in case law from quite a while ago it's not a new issue. 
but it's the work at height regs that provide the specific legal requirement which I'm now going to go through and uh, we'll have a look at as far as reasonably practical as part of this. So there's some interpretation in regulation two of the work at height regs which helps us understand um, how it applies to you guys. Um, the bit that I'm looking at here is the personal fall protection bit and it covers as you can see a number of things but including rope access and positioning techniques. Um, these are reasonably high up the falls protection hierarchy um, as required by regulation six of work at height regs but you should always be considering whether you can do your work without climbing. Um, often that's obviously not going to be the case, but that's higher up the hierarchy as well, and that's how the work at height regulations work. The specific um, information that helps us understand what we need to look at is actually in Schedule 5, in Part 2 and Part 3. So Part 2 um, puts details for work positioning, and this is where the suitable backup is listed as a requirement by law. Um, and then if we go to part three, um, it talks about rope access and positioning techniques, and these are additional requirements, and then it talks about the two separate anchor lines, and this is really what we're here today and what the guidance is trying to outline about how you can achieve that. But that's the legal, that's where it's written legally that you need to do this. Now this is not written for um, a borough culture, this is written for all industries, it's a goal setting and we have to try and interpret this. There is a little bit of detail about when a single rope can be used and we will detail that. I'll, I'll touch on this and then it'll be detailed um, further today. Um, but it's where you, if you could only use um, a single rope in very rare occasions where a risk assessment has demonstrated that the use of a second line would entail higher risk to persons and appropriate measures have been taken to ensure safety. But this will be properly detailed in, in relation to your work um, later today. And really one of the examples of that and one of the rare specific situations is rescue, where the deployment of a second line would introduce delay or perhaps entanglement. Why are we focusing on two lines now? Um, it comes back to what I started with about statistics. Um, too many climbers are still having accidents when they're falling from a tree and one line is involved in it. But also um, some contractors have demonstrated the fact that it is reasonably practical to work off two lines, um, hence the focus, and the industry reviewed their guidance and training. And this has resulted in the publication of, of, the, of the new ICOP and the imminent publication of PG1 um, and the launch of um, Lantra's SRT training course. The, this is the actual um, analysis which is difficult for us to do of the statistics that my colleague did prior to me um, not really up there for you to read the individuals although I think I probably could provide them to people who needed them but really what it highlights um, is I don't know why the 14 there was from the 23 at the beginning of the um, my presentation but what it's really showing is that even in only a you know one or two year period you're having very serious accidents they're all involving serious fractures these are all accidents involved falls with one rope and if we can avoid any of these, obviously, you know, these, these have been life changing for many people and their families. We will try to update these, um, I think, in future as well, which might highlight the issue a bit. And this is what we're here for today. The uh, revised um, ICOP is out and the TG1 will be out very soon and the training is available and this is going to be gone through now. So Sean, presumably, um, is it back to you to, to do the next bit? I presume we're doing the Q and A's all together. Yes, we will be, thank you, Cathy. Um, what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Simon and Simon will take things to from the, uh, the Art Association. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thanks, Cathy, and morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for joining. It's great to see so many people uh, have, have signed in, and uh, I hope you find today is, is a really useful update. Um, the, the stage we're at now, where we, uh, we're basically announcing the launch of, of TG1 and uh, three of the other technical guides as well, is the result of a huge amount of, of work, and, and it's been a, a long and tortuous journey to get to this point and uh, I don't mind telling you that when HSE came to us and told us that we had to uh, 
change our guidance uh, to uh, make sure that everybody had uh, had two lines and a backup, there was quite a lot of resistance. And uh, I know that you out there have all been through that difficult period as well of understanding that uh, we've got to fundamentally change the way that we climb. That's been a really hard thing for, for everybody to accept. And, and it was pretty hard for me and my colleagues at, at the AA in the early days as well. And uh, we argued pretty hard with HSE to resist that change. However, we are where we are. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how, how that process happened. I think um, everybody has received um, a copy of the, uh, the working at height um, document. I'll just share that for a moment so that... <clears throat> Can everybody see that? So the, the Working on High Industry update is just a, an introductory document really for today, but I know um, I wanted you to be familiar with it because um, there's a section about the history, which I'm not gonna talk about today because uh, the, there isn't the time and, and I don't want to go over old ground un, unduly, but it is interesting to know what the background is and how we got to where we are today. So do have a look at that um, if you haven't already read it. And with it uh, in the document, there is you know, a timeline of the various different things that have affected our decisions uh, as we've gone forward over the last 20 odd years. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through all that in detail, but it, it is there and, and it shows the the diligence, I suppose, that we are, as an industry have applied to try to make sure that we are compliant. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go to a PowerPoint um, presentation now, and I hope that, uh, that that'll all make sense to you. Uh, share screen again. So this is where it all started. When I were a lad, this is how we did it. Uh, that's me top left. And uh, I really don't know what all the fuss is about. Um, we, uh, of course, have evolved in the way that we climb trees, but uh, uh, isn't it a great picture? We are bound to comply with the law. And Kathy's talked a little bit about her position. She's set out what the law is. Um, as an industry sector, we've been obviously aware of those, uh, of the Health and Safety at Work, Work Act and the regulations that are set under it. And we have tried to be compliant. And the process that we went through in 2004, when the work up height regulations were introduced in 2005. Uh, we really tried to work with the HSC to come up with a solution. And that solution was accepted and used and was the industry norm for 15 years. And we are now in a different place. And in a way, we can talk about all of that history and all of the reasons and the justifications and, uh, and so on till we're blue in the face. But we are where we are and we now have to move forward. And Kathy talked about accident statistics and our safety record. And we have known all along, all, all over the last 20 years, um, my relationship with the HSE, we've had conversations about our sector being the worst uh, per capita of fatalities and serious injuries. And that's, you know, nobody wants to be in that position and, and, and we don't either. So uh, I know that some of the accident statistics are blurred and it's very difficult to get precise figures and to be able to um, compare them accurately with other sectors because arboriculture is, is a blurred industry. We've got a, a core of professional workers. We've got people who do 
arboriculture and forestry. We've got people who do landscaping, who do gardening. We've got people who are not really professionals at all, um, who are nonetheless calling themselves tree surgeons. So it, it's very difficult to tie down specific accident statistics and allocate them to where people were being compliant when they had an accident or where people were simply uh, completely disregarding current regulations. And that makes it hard. But the fact remains that nobody wants anybody to fall out of a tree. So we must do what we can to improve the safety. In our process of working with HSE and, and other sectors, and, and we talk to a whole range of different people, both inside and outside arboriculture, um, we, we've got a picture of um, where our sector sits and how that relates to industrial rope access. Um, and one of the key seminal moments in the process of our deliberations and negotiations with HSE um, came uh, almost a year ago now in January this year, where we had a meeting with IRATA, which is the Industrial Rope Access Trade Association, um, where they offered to uh, talk to us and to listen to our difficulties that we were having and, and try to come up with solutions. It was a really interesting meeting and two really in interesting things came out of it. And the first of that was that all the people sitting around the table at that meeting from different aspects of industrial rope access were incredulous that the tree climbing uh, sector was still using a single rope because every other sector working at height absolutely for years and years has been using a backup absolutely all the time. It, it's an absolutely standard process for people working in industrial rope access sector. So that was a, a bit of a shock to me, but really interesting that when you look outside from your own little world, that other people are working in a completely different way. The other thing that was really important with the meeting with Irata is that they acknowledged that our industry is unique. It isn't the same as other industrial rope access. We're working in organic three-dimensional structures, which are we cannot have a, a, an engineered anchor within. Um, so any building or, or structure that people have to climb on and work off and abseil from, they all are engineered structures. They all have engineered anchors which they can attach themselves to. So it makes their life a lot simpler than the problems that we have working with trees. So they're, they're organic structures, they're three-dimensional structures rather than a two-dimensional face of a building. And because of that, we actually use a whole range of different um, climbing systems. And in terms of the definitions of different types of system that sit inside the work at height regulations, we use nearly all of them at different times in different positions uh, when we're doing different tasks. And this has been one of the really difficult parts in writing the guidance and making sure that the guidance remains compliant with the regulations, because in reality, we're moving from one system to another system. And what came out in the meeting with Arata was that we as an industry need to take ownership of the, that fact and the way that we work. And as you'll see, the wording that we are now using is personal fall protection system rather than the, the detailed terminology and the semantics around whether it's work positioning or whether it's rope access or exactly what type of uh, fall protection system we're using. We did a lot of work with um, many different people. I've spoken to hundreds of people over the last two years discussing these issues. And I'm sure many of you listening today, uh, I've had conversations with. We've had a number of industry consultations to work through this process, both for the initial uh, version of TG1 and then 
once things started to uh, be turned around by HSE's insistence, then we had further consultations regarding the industry code of practice, and then a second industry consultation on the technical guide. So we've talked to a lot of people, we've heard lots and lots of different perspectives, and it's been a really hard process. And it's been hard for me and for my colleagues and for the technical authors working with us. Um, but I also understand that it's been a really tough 18 months for everybody in the industry. It's been 18 months of insecurity um, with HSE as the regulator telling us that we must be compliant. And that means having two systems or having a backup. But as far as industry is concerned, they haven't, you haven't had access to that detailed technical guidance until now. So I, I appreciate that's been a really tough period and uh, I apologize for that, but we have worked as fast as we possibly can to make sure that we're getting it right. Um, and we are now at the end of that journey. So finally, we have a, an agreed way forward. It's important to understand, and Kathy touched on this, that you know falls from height are real things. When it happens, and uh, I know many of you that I've spoken to have experienced um, a colleague or a, or a friend or somebody they know who's, who's had a, a serious fall from height. You know, if people don't die, but are permanently injured, or even if they're temporarily injured, lives are changed. It changes that individual's life, but also that person's family, their friends, employers, work colleagues, I know people who left the industry after one of their employees uh, fell and uh, was, was seriously injured because the responsibility of that as an employer is, is huge. At the end of the day, we all need to come home safe and that, is, that has to be our aim. So we have an evolution of guidance. As I said, I'm not going to back, go back through all the detail. Uh, here's a, a few images from the early 1998 Guide to Good Climbing Practice, the 2005 version, uh, which has been reprinted a number of times. Um, it, it's quite uh, noticeable uh, in, uh, in that image that there definitely is just the one line. Um, and that was endorsed by HSC in 2005. But since then, we've also produced guidance on MUPs in arboriculture. And then in 2015, we realized that we really needed to have an industry code of practice. So the first edition of the ICOP was produced in 2015. And our intention was always then to produce five technical guides. Uh, TG1, which we're talking about today, tree climbing and aerial rescue. Then TG2 is about use of tools in the tree. TG3, dismantling and rigging. And then the use of cranes in tree work and the use of mutes in tree work. So we have a suite of five technical guides which kind of sit under the ICOP. The ICOP was always designed to be uh, used by the responsible person within an organization, i.e. The, the manager and the competent person, and is about planning and is about the protocols of management rather than actually uh, applying the techniques and, and practical guidance. So it's setting out management protocols and then the technical guides are about are aimed at the climbing arborist and uh, and people working in the in the sector, both those doing the operations and those supervising those operations. So it's very much also aimed at the competent person as well. And each of the technical guides um, at the beginning of each technical section, there's a checklist of key safety points, and those safety points are then collated into safety guides. So in addition to the five technical guides, there are five safety guides. Uh, and those safety guides are relatively short lists of key safety points relating to that activity. Um, 
the <coughs> the technical guides themselves um, uh, will be uh, for sale as hard copy and uh, there's opportunity to pre-order those um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The safety guides will be available as a free download. So there'll be a PDF that you can just download off the website and, and take away. And that can be used as a, as a checklist, but also to audit um, safe working on site. So these are the covers of the four guides that are gonna be available in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we are publishing four of the five technical guides uh, in December. Uh, TG3, Dismantling and Rigging, has been delayed mostly because of the, uh, the extra work that we've had to do getting TG1 right, uh, but we've made the decision that these ones took priority and, and that TG3 should wait and, and that will be published in the spring next year. So um, you'll see in the chat that the, the link to um, the opportunity to pre-order the technical guides is available. Um, Sophie will send out um, an email with these details on after the event as well, but we're, we're offering single copies at £12.50, or if you want to get a bundle of four of the ones that are published in December, that's uh, TG1, 2, 4 and 5, you can get a bundle of four for £45. And uh, that pre-order offer will close on the 11th of December, and then the prices will return to their, their normal price, which will be uh, £15 and uh, £50. Okay, so we're really here to talk about TG1, and within TG1, the the specific area of what what's new in the in the guidance and that is the use of the backup but i've got to say tg1 is a is a big document it can, contains a huge amount of information it updates on the whole breadth of tree climbing activity of planning uh, of um, different aspects of rope access and how to climb it covers use of moving rope technique stationary rope technique, spiking techniques, working within the tree, uh, management and, of equipment and so on. There's, there's a whole uh, range of, of uh, different sections in it, obviously. Uh, and of course, it also includes tree rescue. But we're here today to concentrate on the use of the backup. I'm not gonna talk about the, the rest of the content of the guide. And what I'm going to do now is just pick out a few of the key um, excerpts, if you like, from TG1, which are relevant to today's discussion. So in section six um, is entitled Personal Fall Protection Systems in Tree Work. As we've said, this is the terminology that uh, exists within the regulation, but it's an overall, it's an overall descriptor of different types of systems. And it's described at 6.61 as personal full protection system comprising a primary system and a backup allows the user to ascend, move around the tree and descend using the branch structure for support and anchorage. So it's a simple description and definition. At 6.4, it goes on to say that when a proficient operator is using a personal fall protection system for tree climbing, it's expected that there will be a backup uh, system to prevent them falling a distance that is likely to cause injury if the primary system, including the main line components or anchor, were to fail. And this is what the whole process is about, is it is to stop people falling out of trees that we are doing this. In order to be uh, compliant, it then goes on to say that the backup should be attached to an independent anchor where possible. And it's recognized that within tree climbing, it isn't always possible. So it then goes on to say, if there is no suitable independent anchor, then the backup can be attached or installed over a shared anchor so that you could have 
both your primary system and your backup over either over the same anchor or over two anchors on the same stem very close to each other. Six point five lists the different types of way that you can achieve a backup. And uh, I'm just going to quickly run through those. So basically, A could be two separate primary systems, i.e. two climbing systems, whether that be a moving rope technique or a stationary rope technique or a combination of both. And we would call that dual line working. You can also use a backup device or mobile fall arrester that will move with the user, but lock when a sudden load is applied. Uh, now, backup devices uh, or mobile fall arresters, as they're sometimes described, um, are used a, a great deal in industrial rope access. It's a standard way of, of complying with the law and having, having a backup. Their primary movement is managed on the primary system, but the backup follows and uh, is basically doesn't get in the way. But if the primary system were to fail, it will hold them and stop them from falling. The difficulty with use of backups in arboriculture is that nearly all the systems that are available are designed to work with a full harness and a, a thoracic or dorsal attachment point. And obviously, as climbers, we normally don't use uh, a full harness with those attachment points on. So there are some technical issues which uh, we need to be very careful about. And as the text says, climbers must note specific user instructions regarding harness type and connection points and correct application when using such devices. Uh, there are solutions to some of these issues. And um, I know uh, that uh, uh, the training that's being provided by Lancer instructors will, will go into that to some degree. Um, I'm also aware that there are a number of manufacturers who um, have been sort of following this issue for arboriculture with some interest and uh, that it's very likely over the, the coming months and years that there will be more options for us as climbers. Another alternative to achieving the backup could simply be to use both ends of your climbing rope to create two systems from one rope. So in a smaller tree, for example, uh, using both ends of your rope is a, is a simple solution that's perfectly acceptable. D lists an adjustable lanyard. So uh, if you've got a primary system and you're attached to the tree also by your lanyard, at that moment, you are compliant. And so we've been working compliantly uh, a lot of the time over the years where we've been using adjustable lanyards to secure the work position, say, or to prevent a pendulum swing. But it only is compliant if it's attached to a load bearing anchor. And uh, so if it's just attached to the to the end of the branch you, you're moving out on, then that is not an effective backup, because if the main line would have failed, then you're not necessarily secure. The other issue with uh, adjustable lanyards obviously is the uh, they're not very long and uh, so they can't be used as a, as a backup throughout a climb in a big tree uh, but they can certainly be used as the backup when you're working on a pole so if you're spiking for example then your lanyard would be a completely legitimate backup system uh, so you would have your main line reaching the ground and, and, a, and a, a lanyard around the stem and then the last option that's listed is a belay system. And while this may not be something that's regularly used, it's a perfectly legitimate alternative. And uh, it may be very useful sometimes if, uh, for example, um, you put a throw line up into the tree and you can run a line through, then there's no reason why uh, an, an individual shouldn't climb the tree on one line uh, with a primary system and be belayed be laid during that process. So there's a number of options. And, you know, as, as, as climbers working in the industry day in, day out, you can use a selection of those alternatives at different times, according to the situation you're in. And as you do that, you will 
no doubt come to, to find that some you'll use much more frequently than others. Six point six lists working considerations, and it covers a range of uh, different things. I'm not going to list all of them here because just for for time and space. But in that list, uh, the the third one in that list says that the the climber must connect the primary and backup systems of their harness to the attachment points on their harness by independent connections. And uh, so you'll see in TG1, there are lots of explanations and photos and, and illustrations of how this works. But basically, you can't put a carabiner onto the main attachment point of your harness and then attach two systems to that carabiner. They must be independently connected to your harness. And that may be via a ring on a rope bridge or a swivel on a rope bridge or on two rope bridges, you know, there's a number of different ways that it can be achieved. Um, but the idea of having two systems and a backup is that it gets right, those two systems get right to your harness without an opening uh, connector in between. D states that uh, we should ensure that the full protection system doesn't allow a potential fall distance of more than 500 millimeters. This has been in our guidance uh, from, from the very beginning. There's nothing new there, but it's something that we need to uh, maintain. And E talks about the, uh, the fact that when we're climbing, we should always ensure that there is a, a system that will reach the ground. So an uninterrupted descent to the ground without the need to re-anchor is a basic requirement of your climbing system. So you would maintain that throughout the task that you're doing. And the main reason for that is if you need to self-rescue, you need to have a system that will reach the ground. You do not need to have two systems that will reach the ground at all times. You'll notice there's an asterisk around self-rescue and as Kathy intimated earlier, um, the technical guide states quite clearly that during rescue, whether that's self-rescue or when we are in a, a third party rescue, the backup can be disconnected. That doesn't mean to say it has to be and uh, in self-rescue, you may have two systems and you may maintain those while you descend, um, but if it's a matter of uh, ensuring the casualty's safety and if speed is the issue, then the backup can be uh, disconnected at that point. And the last bit in 6.6 .6 states that you will only omit the backup when number one, it's not practical to maintain it for the specific short duration task of rope advance or change over. In these circumstances, the climber will remain stationary during the procedure and reinstate the backup as soon as possible. We're talking here about um, rope advance. So when we're body thrusting, um, working up the tree from branch to branch, uh, during those changeovers, it is acceptable to reduce to one system holding you in the tree while you reinstall the second system. You can use three systems if you want to, but it's acceptable to reduce to, to one at that, point, at that point. It also applies to moving uh, your systems around when you're in the tree. So within the canopy, if you need to move one of your two systems to a different anchor point in order to get a better position, if you're working out on one side of the crown, for example, then again, during that changeover period, provided you don't move your position, uh, you can reduce to one system while you make that changeover. And then the second example where the backup may be omitted is when carrying out a rescue of a casualty, where the speed of the rescue is crucial to the casualty's safety. So those are the key points that uh, I wanted to bring out. And I know when Chalky and John um, 
run the videos later and and answer questions some of these points will be re sort of re-emphasized in the videos um, but but those are the key points i wanted to bring out regarding backup in technical guide one i'd like to just emphasize technical guide one is not a training manual it's there to define industry good practice As I said, within the guides, there are checklists um, and those are designed to be used to, to quickly be able to check that what you're doing is compliant and safe. The safety guides that have been compiled out of those checklists will be available free of charge to download. And there's a, a, a safety guide for each technical guide. There's no question that this is a significant change to the way that we work and training and consolidation will be necessary. As a result of this, assessment standards for the uh, license to practice or certificates of competence and uh, the qualifications that Lantra and City and Guilds offer, they will change as a result of this. Um, I know that City and Guilds um, are working on a revision of all of the certificates of competence Lantra are also going to be working on that, and, and Sean will talk a little bit about that later. It's going to take time for everybody to adjust and to incorporate and adapt to the revised standards. But finally, we now have those standards available. We have the ICOP, which sets out the, the principles. And we now have TG1, or in the next couple of weeks, you will have your hands on TG1, which will set out all the detail to explain how you can use it. So uh, that's me done. Thank you very much and good luck. And I'll just leave you with that slide, which gives you the link. Um, uh, but the link will also be sent to you uh, in an email following this event. So that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, if there's any questions, pop them through into the Q&A section and we'll try to cover them uh, at the end in the Q&A section. Right, okay, thank you everyone. So I'm Sean Duffy, I'm from uh, Lantra, uh, the Head of Industry Partnerships there. And also with us today, we've got John Tranchard and Tuki White, who are two of Lantra's uh, verifiers for the uh, aerial suite of training and qualifications. So in this section, I'll briefly be covering um, the training requirements for working at height in arboriculture, um, how we've worked with the AA and HSE to um, update our materials and make sure that we meet the requirements so that people can comply with regulations. Um, what we've done with our refresher suite of training. Uh, and then following that, um, John and Chalky have worked on a, a number of videos, which are all available in the document that was sent out before the event. And they'll be going through um, five of these just to kind of help you visualize what needs to happen in future and how it can look. So these were created. So originally, the plan was that we were going to do these events across the country practical demonstrations where we could show you how things were meant to work, how things would operate, and you could ask questions on them. Obviously, that's not possible at the moment during this pandemic. Um, and rather than just having PowerPoint slides, we thought it might be better if we have some videos to support that for you. So that's worth bearing in mind as we get to that kind of section. Okay, so the training requirements. The ICOP states that all climbers must be adequately trained before they can begin working at height, as I'm sure you're all aware. And this training must be uh, to a nationally recognized standard, and all of those must also be trained in aerial rescue. Uh, and that's basically to ensure that if there is an emergency in the tree, they are able to help someone get down. Those delivering training must meet a number of criteria too. 
and that includes having a high level of knowledge, a high level of practical ability, and also they must be able to demonstrate excellence on demand. All Lantra training instructors are technically evaluated by one of our verifier team to ensure that they meet all of the ICOP requirements prior to being approved to deliver our training courses and assess our qualifications. On top of this, we also ensure that there is um, a requirement to attend recertification training and instructors are also um, subject to quality assurance visits. So that means that we would send um, one of our verifiers or other people out to go and look and uh, make sure that the, the, the training is being delivered to the required standard. So with our training materials, um, Simon mentioned earlier how we've uh, been working collaboratively over the last 18 months to two years, really, to try and make sure that we all uh, follow the same guidance and are, are talking to the with the one voice. Um, we've, um, in the last year, mainly, we've had a lot of meetings with uh, the, uh, the HSE and the ARP Association, where we've done things from practical uh, demonstration events uh, to show what can happen and why it can happen and why things can't happen, as well as discuss uh, discussion groups with HSE to ensure that the content is correct and that we're really delivering the training and assessments that are needed to make sure that people can be operating correctly. In the interim period, we did issue guidance to our instructors uh, to ensure that courses could be delivered under the current guidance, and we continue to update this and um, talk to our instructor network to make sure that this happens on an ongoing basis. All our images and training information have been updated in the workbooks and to, again, show compliance with the guidance. As many people now will have done their training quite a while ago, we decided to um, reissue our Lantra, uh, the new versions of the workbooks as one. So if you go on to a, a refresher course now, you will get the full accessory free um, workbook on the refresher course. So this gives you an opportunity to look at the fully updated workbook so that all of the changes that have happened can be seen and you can understand the flow of it through to where we are now. We'll also be updating our certificates on the refresher side to include TG1 2020 at the end. So again, this will help the audit, uh, uh, audit trails to show that the people that you're working with and yourself have all been trained correctly up to the standards that are required now. Okay, so this next section is what I referred to earlier with the videos um, to kind of show how things look and how you can manage systems going forward. So I'm going to get John and Chalky to introduce uh, the videos, just a short introduction on them to say what's happening and why this um, was chosen. The first one is system choice. Um, Chalky, if I ask you to introduce this one. Uh, hello there. Um, so again, as, as the video states, there's a uh, fair bit to consider in what systems we put together, uh, how we put them together and how we manage them, especially working with the, the way what the, how manufacturers uh, allow us or ask us to use their, their systems or their, their devices. So um, again, the video, as Sean said, all these videos that myself and John have done, they, they were the type of things that we as delivering some, delivering training or delivering uh, uh, an informative session, the things that we would have said, and ideally we would have had people in front of us asking questions, uh, putting points of view across. So um, that's the sort of the, the, the videos that we've done, highlight, highlight what we thought uh, people would want to know and how they'd want to know it. This video, the system's choice one, there are another 15 videos that follow it of lots of different systems and put how they are put together and how they're used and how we can manage them. Again, there's still probably lots of questions that would want to be asked and things, other things that we would want to say while doing these demonstrations that, that we haven't been able to pick up on these videos. So we urge you to, to watch these ones with us now, go away, watch the other ones that have been produced, and then, as Sean has said earlier, send in questions, and hopefully we can then get down 
and give you the answers that, that you may require. So um, press play, Sean, let's see what happens. So within the uh, working at high stuff, we obviously have to have two lines and ideally two independent anchors. And then we're going to be putting stuff on here to make systems. So whatever we choose as, a, as systems to put, put on our lines, they need to be capable of holding your mass independently. One system may become your primary system, another system may just become your backup system. But it, it, whatever ha happens and however you put those systems, or what systems you choose, should one of those systems fail, one of the lines fail, one of the anchor points fail, the other one has to be able to hold your mass. It may not instantly be able to put you back to the floor, but it has to stop you falling out of the tree to full protection. Another consideration is what you choose to put on as systems. Um, we've discussed how to put them to your harness or, or some ideas about the, the harness. A great consideration is how those two different things you put on each rope, how they work together, how they will conflict each other uh, and how you can manage them. So can you get one hand to open both devices to be able to lower you down? Do you always have to have one hand on one device, one hand on the other system, you know, so therefore you haven't got a free hand. So we're going to show you a number of different ways of putting different things together, um, but it's definitely a trial and error, and, and, and look and see how the two things are conflicting. We discussed the left and right. If you're taking a, a rope with a hard system, and you're going to have to pass it over the other rope, to find a branch to the other side, will that conflict with the piece of piece of gear that you're already holding in? Or do you need to unclip it, take it all the way around your back, so it's then on the other side of your harness? Uh, then they are real concerns, and, and us as tree climbers working at height, we should really look at how we put these things together. So we're going to show you some ideas, um, but we, you know, by all means. Have a, have a practice, have, a, have a, a go with these different things. But as always, any new piece of equipment, any new system, low and slow to start with. Good, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar. So the next video we're going to is just really to try and identify what is an unquestionably reliable anchor point within the tree. Um, one of the things we have to work out as a climber when we put our lines on the tree is whether it is suitable to carry two lines or whether we can put one line on it or whether perhaps it will take both. So this short video is just really to try and sort of identify in your own mind what is an unquestionably reliable anchor point. So to just reinforce the point of um, meeting the working at height regulations of having two independent anchors. You now we could argue that in this situation we've complied because we have two independent anchors but it's fairly obvious this branch here is not substantial enough to take any load or any weight. So in this situation we obviously wouldn't use this one and it would make far more sense to have both ropes around the much thicker stem to give us an unquestionably reliable anchor point, but it may just be one. Yeah, so the, the next three videos, I believe, are um, they are the TG1, uh, for want of a better word, e exemptions. So all the, other, the, all the other videos are on the Landfra YouTube channel um, that, that myself and John done. Uh, they are what we call working at highest compliance. So we've got we've got three viable systems at all times. We're constantly connected to two uh, viable full protection systems. Um, and then with the with the uh, odd 
bit in TG1 that says, you know, in certain circumstances, you can fall back to one system. Um, so there's three short videos that just try and highlight when when they, those they, that fallback to one system is is in place. Um, again, uh, situations that that we find ourselves in on 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 doing these videos, there are plenty of branches that you know we, we could have maintained two systems. But just to try and explain what what TG1 was saying when it says about dropping back to one system in changing over retrieving anchors uh, and so on. So that's what the next three videos are. They were the specific sort of TG1 highlight ones in, in three different scenarios. So there's uh, a basic tree climb uh, using uh, prussics. Um, there's a pole climb. So we're again getting getting over an obstacle. Um, uh, and then the, there's an SRT one, which again, uh, you find yourself needing to reposition you know, two, two anchors. Uh, you know, so again, they, they just highlight those. So we'll let Sean run those through uh, and then we'll hopefully we'll have some questions. So in this scenario, I've made my way up on my two anchors, two lines and two systems. Working with our industrial guidance, it says that we can reduce to one anchor point, stroke one system, stroke one line in certain scenarios. So in this case, I'm on a substantial anchor point that I've climbed up on, I've fully loaded, fully tested, it's unquestionably reliable. Double check the system I'm going to suspend on. If I'm happy with that, that I can then release my lower system, I was back to exhaust. I'm not moving, I'm not moving up, I'm not moving down, I'm not adjusting anything, I'm just where I am. I can now off one system, look where I need to go. Stop to another suitable anchor point. Again, I'm closing my carabiner. Bring my second system into play now, which I'm going to load, fully test, double check, and now I can continue my way up on my two lines, two anchors, two systems. Once more, I can use my lanyard as well, and I can carry on with my three systems, or again, mitigate out. I've got a substantial anchor point, check my systems, fully loaded, happy. I can remove my lower or my exhausted system, because I'm not moving up, round or down, I pick my next anchor point, and I can continue to pitch up. So again, working within the uh, our industrial guidance, being able to one anchor. Um, again, this is another another real scenario where that may take take place. A lot of the times, we've got other anchors, the trunk of the tree, or other stuff around us, and we can normally maintain our, our two anchors. So in this scenario, I've got two SRT lines that are retrievable, and they're retrievable together. So they're both going to have to come out together. So I need to land it in somewhere. I'm 
And again, with the, the harness choice I have, I have my lower, lower Ds that I can suspend from. So before I do anything else, I'm going to fully load my my new my new single anchor. Uh, it's around a reasonably substantial piece of tree. But once I'm happy that that's, that's got me, then I can start to remove my other anchor. So I'm just going to put lower one and then lower the other. And so check, check. So once I'm happy, then I can start my retrieval process because both my anchor points are going to retrieve together. It's going to be difficult to maintain two of my systems. So I could have set a, a retrieve line, but uh, in this case I, I'm just going to retrieve with my with my poles. If I was dismantling or something, I'd probably have my poles for reaching lines, and uh, again limit the amount of rope on the floor. Now I can just pull my pair of my pair of stationary rope lines out, and I can disconnect one, pull it back reinstall it lower down the tree and then do the same with the other one and then I've got my three viable ball protection systems back in place. So in this scenario, I've progressed up my stem uh, using my two lines, two systems, two anchors. In this case, one big anchor. Uh, I've got my wire core flip line, which I've crossed. That's offering me some ball protection, so a small guy on the stem. Uh, I've got a pinball saver down here with a, a device on, on my long line. So now if I want to progress up, I have a, a, a union to get round. So working within my industrial guidance, I can revert back to, should I choose, to one anchor. So of course I can always just take my lanyard and put round, but if I want to, again, it will give me some room to manoeuvre. So I'm on one anchor, but I'm not moving, I'm not climbing the climbing the tree, I'm not going off, I'm not going down, I'm stationary. So tested anchor. Again, I'm now back onto two anchors, fully load, fully test, fully check. Everything's happy. Yeah, before I disconnect. Lower anchor. Now going to progress past the branch. So I'm going to put my zip line in. Flipping it back to my lower D in this scenario. Put my flip line in, the branch is going to offer me full protection until I need to transition further. So as I go up, I can continue to move my move my equipment and just progress up. Okay, thank you. Uh, as I said earlier as well there all of these videos are available on the lantry youtube page and they will um hopefully answer a lot of questions that you may have um in the meantime though i think we'll start to look at uh questions that have came up uh before the event and during the event today so 
Before we go on to that, though, does anybody have anything else they'd like to add? Simon, Kathy, Chalky or John? Nothing particularly from me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm replying to some of the questions on chat, but um, otherwise interested to hear what, what questions we've received. OK. Right, so I'll stop sharing the screen now and I'll, I'll go through a list of them that have come in so far. Um, right, question one. How do we police the level of training that is being delivered? Colleges are offering training, though they deliver with inexperienced staff. Um, so really, yeah, that is the, the question is, so how do we please the level of training that is being delivered? Do you want me to do that one? Yeah, if you carry on with that, Jorky. Yeah, so uh, as uh, Lantra, Lantra can, can police, police its instructors. Uh, so if someone is a Lantra instructor offering a Lantra training course, a registered Lantra training course, uh, then we can audit that or Lantra can have that audited. Uh, the materials provided by Lantra, uh, the insurance, the instructor delivering that course uh, has an audit process and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so we can, oh, Lantra can police our own organisation. Um, other organisations may well want the police can police themselves. Uh, if you have a, a college or a, a, an organization, uh, they may well be using Lantra instructors, but not running Lantra courses. Then again, we, we as Lantra can't police that. We can't police what uh, colleges do and how they do stuff uh, themselves. Uh, some independent training providers or uh, some colleges, they may run some fantastic courses and they may run to the same Oh, we've lost you there, Chalky. Oh, um, are we back in the game now? Yes, you're back now. Um, so, we, uh, as Lantra say, we can only police our own organisation. Uh, there is no uh, catch-up for, for every training, every assessment that takes place uh, within the Arbor World Cultural Industry. It'd be lovely if there was, Obviously, with the, the ICOP, we have us this recognition of, of how training should be, but there's no overarching organisation or catch up that, that would that would uh, fight a point for us on, on that case. I'm afraid, as an employer uh, sending sending staff for training, or as someone looking for training, uh, again, all I can say is ask questions, find out what that training will be, who will be delivering it and to what standard before you, you uh, uh, pay your money, really. I think that's, that's probably the, the best thing that we can say. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the next one is, if a climber has an accident, I might summarize these questions a bit. If a climber has an accident using only one system, uh, what would happen? What would be the consequences, essentially? Uh, who wants to pick that one up? Kathy? Obviously, there is an element of agency there, yeah. Yes. Um, so, to clarify, you're saying what would happen if someone had an accident, is it? Yes? Yes, and they weren't compliant with the, with the regulations. Okay. Um, well, presumably, it depends whether it's reported or not as to whether HSC come to know about it. If it was reported and it resulted in, um, it would normally probably result in fractures and likely be put out for investigation. If it was, we're obviously going to look at the interpretation that work at high regs with now what is seen as to be the accepted industry guidance, which is going to be TG1 here, um, because it is the law. And that's what I was trying to, to type out. It's been the law for a while and now you've got clear guidance on it. So they're not using two lines and two backups and can't justify it. They're likely to have broken the law and perhaps okay. you know, contributed to the accident. OK, thank you. Um, OK, the next one. Again, just to, I'll try and summarize it to keep it short. Uh, compliant contractors will not struggle to implement the requirements of TG1. However, it does take more time as a result. And as a result, they will be undercut on price by those who are unaware of the changes and those who choose to ignore it and want to cash in, knowing full well that HSC have little resource to enforce it. Um, Simon, if I hand that one over to you about this, Compliant contractors and TG1 and being undercut by um, 
those who choose not to do it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, this is a, an age old problem. In a way, it's been it's been with us for, for many years. We've we've had what we would call a an uneven or non level playing field for a long time. And uh, I touched on this in my presentation about the range of different people who call themselves arborists uh, or tree surgeons. And uh, some are highly professional and working compliantly and, and others are at the opposite end of that spectrum. So that is a big problem that we've had in our industry as, for as long as I can remember. Um, we are constantly trying to, to redress that and change that. And um, we, we have regular conversations with HSE to, to ask what support can be supplied from a regulatory position. But, but the reality is we know that you know, the government uh, is not keen on um, increasing more and more regulation. They're always looking to industries to resolve their own issues. And, and we do that by professionalizing our organizations. We do that by increasing the, the respect due to us as a profession by working to high standards and slowly bit by bit we will achieve the point that the sort of shangri-la or the, the the end game which is where society understands that people who uh, work in our sector are due the respect and, and uh, of working as professionals and that therefore they won't choose to use uh, the cowboys well, we're, we're, it's a long way to get to that point yet. And um, I, think, I think that all we can do is, is to keep plugging away and to keep supporting those that we know that are working compliantly. There are now more and more larger clients are, are making very clear choices about what range of contractors they will consider tendering for work and that sort of thing. As you know, the, the AA's um, Arbor Proof Contractor Scheme uh, represents a standard that a lot of uh, larger clients now will will use as their sort of benchmark. But the other thing that's changing in society is that you know, us as the custodians of green infrastructure in our urban environments um, is becoming more and more important and, and that's being recognised more and more. And I think that that's, uh, that's an introduction to this sort of status of, of professionalism that we're working towards but we've got a long way to go and uh, I, I wish I could I wish I could give you a, a, a nice quick and easy answer. Thank you Simon. John can I add something? Yes of course. Um, I mean you know if you really want to go to the point where you want to, to try and do something about it and it has to be dealt on circumstances obviously concerns and um, complaints can be put into HSE if you search on the HSE website you can on to concerns you can put them in we will also investigate those um, as long as they're well detailed and do you know refer to risk so if somebody was working on one line predominantly and you had a concern about that then we would think that would be um, if that is the case and, and a breach is identified which would be easy to establish now we've got the guidance then the people that you know the duty holders could be up for um they'd be charged for under the fifa intervention that in itself is a problem they may have enforcement action taken in terms of notices to resolve the issue um and obviously you know as i referred to earlier if you break the law you know there have been prosecutions apparently there was a three hundred thirty-four thousand pound fine for a dangerous occurrence involving the um, not compliance with the work at height regs recently so there are things we can do which can send quite a big message to the industry actually but you have to think about how you want to deal with that at the time um, but those are options as well okay thank you sorry i've had to turn my video off my keeps flashing off but my internet is unstable um okay the next one um how do you practically uh, practically extend a tree with two ropes or that's either having two in the same area leading to the separate lines rubbing and possibly damaging ropes climbing above and fighting against your lower line. Um, John, if I leave that one to you. Yep, no problem, Sean. Um, it, it really comes down to, to management and it comes back to a bit of resetting uh, of your mindset when you're putting ropes in. This is obviously an issue, particularly if you, if you pull two ropes in over one anchor and you're on a moving rope system, then the ropes are going to rub together. Um, also, climbers need to start looking at the other options to them. You know, stationary rope systems 
sometimes for access in particular work a lot better because you can send your lines up and they're fixed in a position. So there's a very small amount of time the ropes are moving, then there's less chance that they're going to rub. They're also, if, if you're still working with a moving rope system, you need to start thinking about installing cambium savers. We should be doing this to look after the trees, particularly if we're pruning. Um, but the trees offer us lots of options. You know, try and look for different branches to put your ropes into whilst you're climbing. Look at how you can organize your ropes so that they're not rubbing. Having two independent attachment points on your harness so they're connected in different places works very well. And also don't forget the other options as Simon touched on earlier on in the tech guide. Be laying somebody into the trees, an extremely efficient way of putting, putting somebody into the tree. So the climbers could install their one rope as normal. Somebody either with poles or a throw line could install the line much higher. That could come back down to the climber. And then the ground staff can effectively belay the climber into the tree. And the ground staff also quite often when the climber is going into the tree are often redundant. And a very simple way is if you've got one tight line and the climber is progressing on that line, the ground staff can be taking in the slack on the second system. It doesn't have to be murder tight. We're allowed 500 mil of slack. So that climber could be belayed into the tree as they're going. So you can probably take from my answer that there are lots of different ways of achieving it. And if you are struggling with any of these ways, the best thing to do is to get yourself on some training courses where people can just show you what to do. Refresh your training one day, get all the questions we can answer to you, we can show you, and then you can work out the best system for your job. Thank you, John. Um, Next question up, uh, has there been any consideration for those working in proximity to power cable and the management of lines? Uh, that refers more to utility arboriculture. Yeah, I can, I can take that one for you, Sean, if you like. I mean, I've, I've recently been doing a fair bit of training work with, uh, with Fountains Forestry, who, you know, are part of the OCS group, working all over the country with all different types of power lines. Um, the, the answer to the question is, it makes no difference. They have adopted two-line climbing um, for quite a while. They've recently gone an extra, extra mile where they are uh, introduced CE climbing systems. So everybody is climbing on the same systems, but everybody is climbing on two lines and two ropes at all times. You have to put your ropes in with poles because they can't use throw lines for obvious reasons. But if the major contractors can make it work and they're happy to make it work, it can put no more significant risk into the climbing day than any other climbing system. Thanks, John. Um, another one, how can I realistically carry out good R pruning work if I can never climb above an unquestionably reliable anchor? I might have four or five meters of tree above the highest anchor that complies that need to reduce the upper crown by one to two meters. Uh, any volunteers on that question? Uh, uh, and I know the technical guide talks about the use of different types of anchor. Uh, so we, we talk about the, the personal fall protection system anchor should be unquestionably reliable. And, and John showed uh, some examples of, of that in the video. And, and I think everybody understands what we mean by unquestionably reliable. It, it really has to be what other people would call bomb proof. However, we also talk in the technical guide about positioning anchors. And uh, in the past, we've referred to this as, as supplementary anchors. So a positioning anchor may not be that unquestionably reliable anchor, but it's still acceptable to use. So for example, in the way that the questioner has just described that, so you, you put in your, your main anchor points in the tree in really good bomb-proof anchors, but you still need to climb above that point. There will be anchors above that which will support your weight, um, but you wouldn't want to spend your whole day uh, on those anchors. Uh, but they're certainly acceptable for short duration tasks, such as climbing up to uh, to do some sort of handsaw pruning to the tips of, uh, of a crown, for example. So that's specified in the technical guide quite clearly. There's images showing it where effectively the climber is working above their bomb-proof anchor, but using a positioning anchor to hold themselves in position. Okay, thank you, Simon. 
Um, another one that I've come through, can you attach two lines to a device that is then connected to the harness via a carabiner? Uh, I'll have this one if you want. Um, so, the, so some manufacturers are happy for you to connect uh, devices to devices. Uh, uh, Petzl Zigzags, for example, um, they, they show up within their user information. Uh, again, John talked about the CE climb systems, again with the, the hitch climber pulleys and stuff. Uh, they have a, you can connect a uh, lanyard into the back if you want to. Um, and so the manufacturer is happy for us to do that. Uh, TG1 is not happy for us to do that. That's, that's the, the, the crux of it, realistically. So whatever systems you choose, uh, they need to be independently carabined back to the bridge on your harness. The bridge on your harness may well be uh, have a ring or a, a swivel or, or some other anchorage device on it, but, but both lines, both systems need to be independently anchored back to the bridge on your harness. And it, it, it can be a bridge or two independent bridges. Uh, again, working at heights doesn't stipulate our harness bridges. Uh, so we can have one bridge or we can have two bridges. Uh, different manufacturers make the harnesses in different ways. Um, but yeah, so yeah, can't piggyback equipment. Can't piggyback equipment. And that's in our industrial guidance. Okay, thank you, Chalky. Uh, another one here, when accessing a crowd, can you use two lanyards or does it have to be a main line and a lanyard so you can descend to the ground in the case of an emergency. Did I have that one as well? Yep. Uh, yeah, so that, that's tree size. So again, uh, yeah, in our industrial guidance, TG1, again, says we should have a line long enough to get us back to the floor. So should you choose to climb a tree using one long line and two lanyards, uh, so you leapfrog your lanyards uh, around as you move around the crown, so as you exhaust one, you connect another one uh, and exhaust that. So as long as everything's on, you know, all, or two of your systems are on unquestionably reliable anchors, so your lanyards are long enough to make, allow you to do that, that's perfectly acceptable within our industrial guidance. Should you need to get down or self-rescue, you have one long line with you or installed capable to get down. If you're on a pole climbing a, climbing a featureless stem, uh, you may find that you've got two lanyards and your long line is not installed uh, at a given moment, but you still have it with you. Uh, again, if you've got a very complex tree, you're lanyarding your way around, uh, your long line at some point won't be installed, but at other points it will be. So you have the capability of self-rescuing. Um, we did have a, a question about branch walking uh, and running to uh, double rope systems or to... Um, uh, moving rope systems. Uh, again, having uh, a couple of lanyards may well be the way of reducing some friction. If you, if you can't be bothered to go and reposition uh, your anchors, uh, you know, you may, may end up with two lanyards and leapfrog those lanyards down the branch. You've still got two anchor points and two lines, two anchors, two systems installed. You are compliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Chalky. Um, I've got another one here, but I think it's regarding rescue. Let me just read it through. If you have two bodies of a tree, are you able to justify use of one rope each, dependent on tree size, to ensure that, all, that safety for the climbers from the ground? If there are too many ropes dangling from the tree, it becomes tedious work to ensure you don't have ropes tangled in brash. Yeah, I can take that one for you, Sean, if you like. Uh, um, thank you, John. It's um, if, if you think about the rescue purposes, you're going up to do a rescue and you get to your casualty. Uh, the casualty hopefully is going to be on two ropes, but he may be on one rope, depending on if he's following the, the technical guide. But when you get to the casualty, as long as you make sure that you have a harness to harness attachment that is in a load bearing position on your harness. So an ideally from your front attachment to your front attachment, and that is load bearing. So it could be your lanyard or something else you've installed. It would then be acceptable to admit one of your climbing lines if you're on two so that you have one climbing line and the casualty has one climbing line and then you you are still meeting the, the requirements of having two lines in the tree because of your harness to harness attachment point and so you, you don't want to make a, a rescue more more difficult um, 
actually having two lines in the tree from a trainer's point of view, I found actually makes the job a lot easier. If you, if you have two lines in the tree as a climber yourself, you get to the casualty, you put the harness, the harness attachment in, you could take one of yours off and put it on the casualty and bring them down. But you don't need to maintain four, I think is the, is the answer to the question. Uh, one line for the casualty, one line for you is, is sufficient to get to the ground, should do the job, as long as you have a harness to harness attachment to back up both systems. If I can just um, add to that, uh, Sean, if that's okay. Uh, Absolutely. I completely you know, agree with what John has just said. I'm not sure whether the question was about rescue um, or whether it was about two operators climbing arborists working in the same tree. Um, uh, and if that was the question, and I'll, I'll, forgive me if I've misunderstood, but if that was the question, then you would still be expected that both climbers maintained um, their primary system and a backup, you know, just as any single climber would. And, and the other thing, just to, uh, uh, as a matter of sort of follow on, really, from what John was saying about rescue, in technical guide one, uh, we obviously advocate that people practice rescue on a regular basis uh, so that if they need to do it in earnest, that, that they've got some experience at doing it. Um, and re regarding two ropes, one of the key points that we have uh, specified is that although in a real rescue scenario, what John has described would be completely acceptable and reasonable, we are not advocating that if you are practicing rescue, that you do that omitting the backup. Um, and we, we've described uh, some clear scenarios there of ways to ensure that during practice you've got the extra protection necessary that you would do under any normal climbing operation. Uh, I hope that makes sense, but TG1 explains it in, in a, lot more, a lot more clearly than I've just done. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Um, right, we've, we've got some questions that are in there that I think they're better answered um, they're very similar. So let me see if I can pick up one more from here. And then anything we haven't answered, we will put together a response for and all the questions that have been asked today will be answered and they'll be made available as well. So if someone might have asked a question that you would like to know and they'll be made available as will the whole of the presentation. So this video will be available to anybody uh, to view in the future that's been asked a couple of times too and we'll share links to that once it's already um okay i think here we go right so we used to be encouraged to have an independent rescue line in the tree now we have two systems can we now do away with a rescue line who, who wants to say that anybody wants to say that one I can I can take it if you like. I mean, why why would you want to get away with the rescue line? One of the, the most important parts of a climbing day is that you've got a, perhaps an independent rescue line for your climbers to to get into the tree. So, you know, although we've got our own two lines in the tree that we're working with, we may be in another portion of the tree and our lines may be compromised. That's the reason why we need rescuing. So. The purposes of putting a, a, a rescue line in the tree is, is really good practice that many, many arborists should do wherever possible. I know it's not always possible in every scenario, but if you can put a rescue line in the tree, then carry on doing it. Don't stop just because you've got two ropes in there because you know it, does, it won't really help anybody get to you in the event of an accident. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, thank you everyone for being part of today and thank you all for attending as well um, as I've said we will answer all of the questions that were submitted uh, we will make the video available online for people to come and view afterwards those who couldn't attend um, and if you do have any questions after this event that you think of later on please do send them in and we'll be more than happy to put a response together for you um, so yeah just for me to say thank you all and goodbye and thank you Simon, Kathy. Chalky and John, it's been really appreciated um, and really informative. Thank you very much.